All right, so let's start. Yeah, good. So um, I'm very excited to actually bring this uh, presentation to you originally. Um, so I'm from Iwan, and you'll know about Iwan in a second, but originally I intended to do a talk per communities. We have four communities in which we do different surveys in terms of insects and pollinators. And so I was, uh, um, um, I wanted to do one for Somerville and Amy operates a lot in Somerville as well. And I said, how about we do a co-talk, right? And uh, then COVID-19 happened, right? And we canceled all our physical talk, meaning it was supposed to happen at the armory for this one. And I said, okay, Amy, why don't we do a webinar instead? And because, you know, it's a webinar, then how about me from the EY side, I reach out to all the community at the same time, which I wanted to do regardless, and have Amy as well, because at the end of the day, it's really about urban insects, right? So uh, here, just to show you, this is, we're going to talk about insect tonight, and we have really a lot of cool insect to show you and cool stories to tell you about. And here are a few of our uh, partners from the EWA side, and Amy also have a few more partners that she work with, which actually are not showing there, such as a Mount Open Cemetery. just realized that. Um, to situate a little bit, I'm going to start, and then Amy will take over, and we'll go back and forth. So if you have questions, you can put that in the chat. However, if you do that in the chat, because I'm going to control the slide to avoid going back and forth, you know, sharing and sharing, uh, please, please do that in the public chat rather than privately, because Amy might try when I talk to answer a few of your questions, and she won't be able to see that if it's a private chat, right? And otherwise, we'll try to keep a little bit of time at the end, right, to uh, answer all your questions. So I'm going to start, and I'm going to start about uh, talking about Iwa or Earthwise Aware uh, in a few seconds, just to situate a little bit who we are. So I'm Claire O'Neill from EWA, which stands for Earthwise Aware or Iwa for short. And uh, our angle is biodiversity. Uh, I come from Europe and I come from France. Biodiversity is a big part of uh, what we do in, in my country, but I'm also now an American. So I'm very happy to bring you know, some aspect there in America. So for EY, it's all about biodiversity and how to protect it. And our means of doing that is through bringing biodiversity knowledge and science, ecological ethics and environmental leadership to the core, the root of organization and communities and in the daily lives of people. Uh, people know us who are etiquettes. We have um, a bunch or set of um, uh, ecological guides and etiquettes which focus on habitat, species, um, uh, explaining how maybe to handle better our many human activities. Uh, so we have really set of right now about 18 etiquettes this way and guides. We also, some people also know us through our nature lesson plans, which are more direct experience that uh, people can take outside and um, uh, involve you know, their friends or their children with. Uh, but we now are really, we start to be well known about our citizen science uh, and our citizen science is a co-creative citizen science. I explain in a minute what it is. And uh, we are really focused on biodiversity and habitats rather than just one little angle there. Right. So that's us in a nutshell. Amy? So I'm from Lesley University in our Department of Natural Sciences and Mathematics. Um, and our, our department, our division uh, has very much a focus on urban ecology, natural history uh, as an urban university and as a university that has a historical emphasis on education and outreach. Urban ecology is a really important part of that. It's something that everyone in any city uh, can use to get in touch with, with where they are at um, and uh, what we call place-based learning, really getting people attached with the place they're in and the other creatures that are sharing that place with them. So we have a lot of interest in this kind of general idea of urban ecology and the importance it has on, on uh, human beings. Um, and my work in particular, I have a background looking at the community ecology of insects. I did a lot, a lot of work with ants, was sort of my first and forever love will be the ants, but I'm expanding out more now to look at other urban insects, um, the other social insects, termites and bees, I kind of worked in that direction. And now I'm working on learning uh, other pollinators and their ecology as well. So I'm very interested in how insects are different in urban environments rather than suburban environments, rather than rural environments, um, and all the important benefits of insects and why we need to conserve them. So to give you a little bit of a, a taste of uh, uh, some of the things that we see when we do this kind of work here is here. So just we have four little slides with four beautiful little pictures and there is many more at the end. 
So uh, this one, I forgot where it was taken, but uh, they are actually at the growing center in Somerville. Uh, this is a bicolored striped sweat bee. You learn so much when you do this kind of work. Um, here, this one was in the street of Somerville, right? So you have a white dotted prominent moth. And by the way, uh, if you join us and help us this year, um, I promise that we will teach you how to take pictures like that with your phone, right? Um, which is what I did. This one is mine with my phone and the one before as well was with my phone, right? Um, and then we have uh, here a monarch, uh, Bill took it, so it's probably, Bill is one of our citizen scientists, so it's probably in the middle sex spells. Um, and here, uh, if I had you in front of me, I could see you, I would quiz you to say, okay, do you guess what it is? Many people say, oh, it's a bee. It's actually not a bee, it's a fly, right? So uh, we see a lot of this uh, a hornet fly uh, that was again in the fells there. Fells is a wonderful little habitat as well. So we want to start by telling you a little bit what is citizen science. There is a lot of confusion about it or it's actually not even known. Uh, what is citizen science? It's actually known under many different names and here they are. It's uh, community science for some, it's volunteer monitoring, uh, citizen science or sit sci for us or for a large community in the citizen science community network science, crowd science, civic science, all of that, right? Uh, it's originated uh, really uh, in the 90s. Actually, interestingly, it was, the term was invented in two different locations, one in the United States, came from Rick Bunny, who is with uh, Cornell uh, Lab, so uh, eBird, etc., for the birders uh, among us. And his definition were really about, you know, the partake or the public involvement um, or by amateur and non-scientists in scientific research. The, um, the British, so at the time it was not Europe yet, in the 90s, the British actually had another. It came at the very same time. They had another definition, which was more in reaction to big science, right, against big science. And what uh, a, a kind of a evolutionary sociologist brought into the picture is the concept of sharing skills. So it was really the partake of different communities to share the skills in order to solve problems. So I come originally from this side of citizen science because very quickly uh, it started to spread to Europe as a whole and then it got really very well redefined in uh, 2013 and 2016. Uh, we now have a white paper at the European Commission to define co-creative uh, citizen science, which is really bringing communities, different domains, different demographics together to solve you know, a problem uh, such as climate problem or biodiversity problem. And, and now what is really interesting is we start to see this kind of convergence between the different definition between America or you know, uh, Latin America or you know, South America, et cetera, and Europe together to be really about co-creative and co-creative science, really what it is, or citizen science, is uh, again, to have the people joining, not just at the data collection level, but at every single aspect of science at the level that they are comfortable with. Uh, here, just to show you or to tell you what are this picture, um, in the fells, we do also vernal pool uh, monitoring, although this one was not taken in the fells, it was in Europe, when Matt, our pathologist, was in Europe. Here it's at the growing center, and here a um, few other citizen scientists in the fells who were uh, doing some phenological studies or studying um, seasonal cycles on fauna and flora. That's what we do as well there. So I mentioned that a little bit, so just to repeat, co-creative citizen science for EWA is our model. For us, it's all about advancing biodiversity and climate research. And what is important for me, I mean, I've always been a, a big advocate of that, is to give science back to the people, rather to have an NLC dichotomy or segregation between expert scientists and the people. So these are our founding block. For us, it's about species and ecosystems knowledge and bringing and raising you know, knowledge about them. It's about ethics as well. It's about open and global science. So there, my field, my original field definitely come in as I'm a statistician originally, and I'm a data expert and AI, uh, artificial intelligence expert as well. So, and the democratization of science. Amy? So my background in citizen science is relatively more recent than Claire's. Uh, if you could do the first one. I started a couple of years ago, we got this grant uh, with Mount Auburn Cemetery which is a local cemetery. Um, those of you who are in the Cambridge area have probably visited there. It's a cemetery, but they also set it up to be um, an urban kind of wildlife habitat. So they try to use a lot of native plantings and uh, create natural spaces. Uh, and they really were interested in, they had the citizen science program, they got started there and they wanted us to help expand that 
to kind of develop these naturalist training programs, do outreach programs, and expand on citizen science projects. So I began two projects there, uh, monitoring the pollinator diversity um, at their native planting sites, and also monitoring caterpillar herbivory on native versus non-native trees at the site. And it was really just kind of a, a revolutionary experience for me, having not worked with citizen science before, just realizing what could be done working with citizen scientists, how much fun it was to work with citizen scientists, uh, just the kind of discoveries you make working with people and, and finding out why people get involved in this. Um, it was really uh, important for me as a scientist to learn about this option that I didn't really realize was an option before. Um, and it got me excited about doing more of it and doing some in my hometown of Somerville. Uh, where I'm also very interested in figuring out ways to convince the city to expand native plantings and to make the city more hab habitable for pollinators. So uh, last year, we started a pilot project using citizen scientists to monitor uh, pollinators in Somerville. So in this talk, I'm just going to be talking about the preliminary data we did in Somerville. I won't actually be talking about any of the work I did in Mount Auburn, though I would love to do that in another webinar at another time. Actually, uh, Somerville is really one of the big link between Amy and I, because I'm also from Somerville. And we started uh, kind of at the same time, our studies in Somerville, right? So we have slightly different angle, which are actually very well complementary, and that's the beauty of it. That's why we are here together today, and we want to expand that, uh, or help people expand that in other cities as well. So um, often when people ask me about citizen science, they're a little bit scared, right? Because there's this thing about being an expert. And so here are the tough question. Is it hard? Uh, no, it's, it's not hard. I mean, uh, I've done tough citizen science, uh, you know, tracking in Mongolia, all this kind of stuff, right? Uh, but here we're in our cities. We're going to look at insect and pollinators. Uh, it's really not hard. It's about, you know, developing a sense of uh, looking at things around and being aware about our environment. Am I going to learn something? I also have this question. Uh, and yes, every single time. Actually, in my opinion, any scientist, anybody, right? It's only when we tackle the world of uh, insect is we don't know it all. We actually do not know much. So every single day we learn something, right? And you'll know a little bit more in terms of all the missing data that we have. Amy, do you want to take on the next one? Yeah, so is it useful? Absolutely. I think it's something scientists are realizing more and more the way Changes are happening so quickly with climate change and everything else that we're doing to the planet. This is not something we can monitor on our own. We need a lot of help um, and having as many people as possible on the ground collecting data. People who really know their local areas, uh, you know, can go out and know where to go to look for things. Are just, it's just so vital to connect with that local knowledge and people who are passionate about their, their local environment. Um, and is it fun? I would say yes. <laughs> I've had a lot of fun. <laughs> I think I've had a lot of fun. Um, my project involves going out and photographing insects and flowers, which is just fun to do anyway. So um, yeah, I think it can be a lot of fun. It is. It is, I think. And on top of that, you know, we often do things in groups as well. So uh, we, we, we kind of create this community, these little families and people have uh, fun together as well doing that. All right. So uh, what we want to talk about is also why do we need a citizen science and, you know, natural history, you know, learning about the different relationship between the different entities. Why do we need that? So um, me coming, I come from the angle of biodiversity. Uh, it always has shocked me, and certainly here, right, everywhere, but certainly here, somehow we are behind in terms of grasping the importance of biodiversity. And we also have an issue uh, in the sense that we do not realize really the loss of biodiversity that is happening right now, right? Uh, I like this quote, I forgot where I found that, I should bring it, it's in the reference somewhere. You know, biodiversity loss is the most important story that most people have never heard about, and that's definitely true here. And uh, this is really crazy for me because biodiversity, which is all, you know, the, diff the diversity of life, you know, from plants, insects, etc., and how it works together, it touches every aspect of our life, right? It's the fabric of life. Uh, why has it lost being ignored? I have no idea. I don't have the answer. But that's something that I would like that we ask ourselves. Why? Why do we miss it? So you might wonder about why do I have a hippo here on this slide? You'll know that in a minute. So. Biodiversity. Biodiversity, uh, for people who follow the news, and certainly uh, uh, news, for example, from the International Panel on Biodiversity, IPES, uh, we've uh, learned in the past few uh, decades, or in the decade, that there is a great decline going on. 
Uh, I think that in 2018, there was uh, one of the big reports from the Living Planet Index, which is uh, uh, co-granted or co-sponsored by WWF and other organizations, involving thousands of scientists worldwide who starting to bring the issue that 60% of the average of populations are in decline, right? Um, so, population of vertebrates, in vertebrates. So here, what I want to bring it uh, uh, to is actually to talk about our insect. And our insect decline uh, up to last year, there was a, a famous study which has been published, which really uh, revealed somehow that we have understanding of a decline of 40%, about 40% of insect species, right? Actually, I don't know if you followed the news, but a few days ago, last week, there was another paper as well, which listed a slightly less numbers, while you know some other countries might list a higher number. No matter what that number is, you know, this kind of decline in the past few decades is really indeed you know, something that is uh, uh, jaw dropping. Uh, in general, so you see here, you know, this NER. So here what I'm talking about is uh, uh, the, the extension rate, the basic extension rate or natural extension rate. What we should know about, uh, what we should know is that right now the current rate of extension of species is going roughly 1,000 to 10,000 above or manifold more than the basic extension rate, where a basic extension rate is extension rate of species if humans were not intervening, interfering. So to go back to this hippo, what is it, right? Actually, the hippo is a very cool mnemonic that I was reminded of when I was listening to E.O. Wilson, who is kind of the modern or the modern father of modern biodiversity. He revived the world biodiversity, right? Uh, this is a mnemonic. Each of the letters that you see, H-I-P-P-O, correspond to one of the threats, the major threats, the major threat to biodiversity. So if I had you in front of me, I would ask and try to guess, but we're going to do that uh, you know, this way. This is what they are, habitat destruction or degradation, invasive species, right? Pollution, population growth, right? And over harvesting, right? So these are the major threats to biodiversity. It, they are not necessarily in a very, in a, in, how do you say that, uh, the, the order of threats, right? Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, pollution, not pollution, but climate change is also coming as a, a factor uh, that is taking more and more importance. It doesn't, it's not the sole reason of biodiversity loss, but it's also one of the big factors that is getting amplified as of recently. So uh, quickly, a few of the thing that uh, why we need citizen science is there is a lot of data and models that are you know not necessarily fit and missing data right so these the six that you see here species interaction dispersal demographic data etc are some of the six biological mechanisms that are uh, not yet really uh, completely understood or are missing from current predictive models so our need right now is to understand predict and act in a timely manner right and the issue that we have is why do we need to observe? Why do we need to collect data? Why do we need to really fill these models? Is because what was observed today, yesterday is changing today. Things are changing very rapidly now, right? There is a pace of change that is much higher than before. Uh, not enough is observed. Actually, uh, here as a little example, often we focus on charismatic species and not necessarily the obscure little species. These obscure little species in between are very important in order to draw the entire picture of what's happening at a system level. Right. They are part of the web. Um, we also do not necessarily study things in a continuous manner. We have sparse data, you know, something happened in a month and then we don't do things for a few months. So continuous data, which is more about natural history in a sense, is lacking. And that's where we're bringing it to the picture. And as I said, you know, that you can see on the left, you know, some factors are truly completely missing, such as species interaction. Uh, such as, you know, you see uh, a pollinator, but what is it sitting on, right? What plant? We need to understand more about this kind of interaction as well. What are the other species around it? We focus, we have a detail-oriented vision, we forget the big picture. This big picture is missing. But the good news is that citizen science, us having you with us, you know, to observe all together can really fill a lot of these gaps. And that's what Amy and I are doing in Somerville in our region. Amy? Yeah, so just uh, stressing again, uh, like Claire said, uh, to what, how important insects are when we're thinking about biodiversity loss. Um, in my classes, when I'm talking about the hippo effect and biodiversity, I, I ask people to picture, when you hear that word biodiversity, what sort of images come into your head? It's often things like jaguars or polar bears, toucans, giraffes, elephants, you know, big kind of charismatic animals. Um, but then I show them this graph that you guys can see at the bottom. This is the graph of all life on earth um, and you can see if you can see there's a tiny tiny little sliver 
right on the bottom that says chordates. That's where all those big megafauna fit in. And then everything else <laughs> is uh, mostly insects. So the vast majority of biodiversity and life is insects. One out of every four species on the planet is a beetle. Um, so when we're thinking about losing biodiversity, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about losing all these insect species, many of which we don't even know where they are. Some of which we don't even have names for. Um, and they're being lost at a very rapid rate. Uh, they likely have the highest rates of extinction out of every, any group, but uh, they just haven't been studied um, until recently. There were studies coming out 20 years ago warning that there might be this massive loss of insects that we just weren't recording. Uh, more recently, some studies have started to actually document that, the uh, same one that Claire mentioned, a famous study that came out last year, no, a couple years ago, um, showing that in some areas of the world there might be insect declines of up to about 75%. Uh, there's been other studies since then with different numbers, 25%, 3%, 40%, but they're all showing massive declines and concerning declines. Um, and losing those insects is going to affect everything that depends on insects, all the birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, all the larger charismatic megafauna that are feeding on them. If they're gone, then we're going to lose them too. Um, but the good news is, my last point, is that um, in urban habitats, we have a lot that we can do to support healthy, diverse insect populations. I say it's maybe difficult to conserve a grizzly bear or a polar bear in a city, but you can conserve insects um, by making choices about what you plant, where you plant it, how different habitats are connected. But there's a lot that we can do in a very, very small space to do a lot to protect insects. So uh, thanks, Amy. So I just want to uh, bring uh, some other lights as well. So yes, uh, this uh, famous um, uh, study by the Germans, very important one, who were uh, showing population declines up to 75% uh, in something like 63 different sites. And what was scary, by the way, is that these sites were uh, uh, a uh, site that were uh, really important and common, right? So the other thing too is the loss of insect drive population declines of birds. Actually last year in France, uh, they definitely linked that. So there was, uh, we were starting to discover in France that we were losing, you know, a huge part of our bird population, even our common birds, and that's scary, right? Common birds, right? So same thing happens with insects most likely as well, that we're losing our common insects there. So just to bring it back again, so, oh, yeah, so here, this is E.O. Wilson. I never can miss to uh, show this picture because I'm so happy this is me here. Uh, I was so happy to be for the first time in the presence of this great, uh, great man. This is E.O. Wilson. He is really our local entomologist and biodiversity uh, advocate, an uh, um, you know, unbelievable man. It was really wonderful to be there last year at his uh, big bio blitz in honor of his 90th birthday. And we participated as he were uh, iNaturalist experts there. Uh, so that's wonderful. All right. Uh, so that's why we do that, right? Again, um, our urban environment are the first place where we can act. So that's why at IWA, what we want to do is really to push people, to bring people to become or to rekindle this kind of naturalist thing that they have uh, in them or in us, right? So natural history, again, is about, you know, kind of a continuous uh, study of what's happening around us, right? Everybody is a naturalist. Even our most famous scientists are um, started really as citizen scientists. People forget that um, uh, Darwin uh, was not necessarily a, a credited, accredited uh, uh, scientist, right? He came much later uh, in uh, the history of science. He started, he was really an observer of uh, the natural world. Um, I don't know if people know this person. She's absolutely a fantastic woman. This is uh, Jane Goodall. I went to listen to her a few years ago. She's sharp as a knife. At, uh, she was 83 at the time. She's such a beacon of hope and an incredible leader inspiration. She was not a scientist. Right? She was an observer of nature. She was chose because of those skills as well. So, and then there is us, there is you. Right? So what I want to do, what we want to do, Amy and I, is to really reclaim the naturalist you know, in us through citizen science. All right, I just want to have a little pause there so that people have a, a chance to also see this quote, which I think is very important going forward. I'm going to read it just to have the same pace. You know, in the years ahead, naturalists have a vital role to play in the future of the world. Next to prof professional scientists, they are one of the most important groups of people for with their help in learning about the world and in protecting it and persuading others to protect it, they will become the guardians of our planet and of our welfare as a species. This was written by Gerald Durrell, a naturalist, something like uh, in the 90s. So it's not even a recent quote. I'm saying it's time to act on it right now. Right.
All right, so citizen science everywhere and at home. Let's start at home, and Amy's going to take uh, the lead there with starting with Somerville. Yes, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about the work we did in Somerville last year. Um, and I called this the Pollinators of Somerville Project. And the goal was to document, document all the insects that were visiting urban flowers. Um, and I call it urban flower visitation because we didn't necessarily know offhand if a, an insect was visiting a flower, whether it was definitely a pollinator. We just took pictures of everything that we could see that was on flowers. So the goal of this project was to document the diversity of the different insects that were visiting flowers um, in our urban area here. And then for me, uh, beyond just getting lists of species, I was also very interested in seeing um, how we're doing in preserving native pollinators versus non-native species and also specialist and generalist species because you tend to get a lot of generalist species in urban areas and people might see a plant and see a bunch of bees on it and think, oh, okay, our pollinators are doing really well, but are those all the same species of bee? Are they all non-native bees? Are they all generalist bees? I'm um, trying to get some, some sense of uh, kind of the the proportion of these different groups within our, um, our, our pollinator population. Uh, the other next goal was to compare the effectiveness of <coughs> photo sampling with citizen scientists versus traditional collecting methods. So normally most studies you would see in urban insects, people are going out and collecting samples of the insects and I wanted to see what percentage of those type of insects could be ID'd to what level uh, using citizen science pho photographing uh, rather than that because that can reduce your impact on the pollinators if you're not collecting as many of them. Uh, but there hasn't been a lot of studies looking at exactly how well that works. That was one thing I was also interested in. And then finally, uh, to do some uh, more outreach work, increasing the populations of native plants um, and potentially investigating planting practices that help those native plants be most healthy and most effective, which is something I wanna do more of uh, in the future. Okay, so what did we do last year? Um, so we got started a little bit late last year, so we only were working at the end of the growing season. We didn't get data from early in the growing season, so that's one of many caveats in the data I'm going to show you right now. Um, so last year, I uh, recruited some citizen scientists to walk 250-meter transects. Um, so we found five people interested in doing this, and they each spent one hour per month uh, between August and October walking these transects and photographing everything they could see on flowers, um, and they were given the instructions to you know every flower whether it was a weed or a planted flower and every insect whether it was a little tiny fly or a big beautiful butterfly um, to the best of their abilities and obviously that's a difficult task to try to photograph every single thing uh, before it flies away but that's what we attempted to do and all their images um, or most of the images were uploaded to iNaturalist other than ones that were not identifiable and it's an open project uh, with public data um, and I just set up a project uh, pollinators to some real that would automatically pull in all arthropod photographs and then I could go into those specific people who were working with me to look at specifically what they collected on their transects um, and this this is an open project so if you go to iNaturalist and look at it you can see everything that we collected um, it also just collects everything that anyone has been collecting in Somerville just to compare to see what things are out there that weren't just on our transects uh, we also added 12 pollinator pots around the city each pot had four native species that would bloom in the spring the summer and then fall um, and people volunteered to host the plants, water them during the summer, maintain them. Um, and uh, so far, everyone has kept up those, those plots and will be continuing to maintain them this year as well, and hopefully adding more. All right, so a little bit of the data. And again, preliminary data, so no big conclusions to be drawn. But um, in those three months, uh, along those five transects, we had a total of 293 observations of flower visitors, most of those in August and September, a little bit of a drop uh, of activity in October. Um, and then the graph here shows what percentage of them could be ID'd to different taxonomic levels, because depending what question you're interested in, uh, you might want to have different levels of identification. So if you're just interested in general biodiversity and comparing sites, you know, order might be all you need. And 82% of those pictures could be easily ID'd to order. But the ones that couldn't were generally photos where Either they didn't get a photo because the insect flew away before they take a picture, so they still recorded that they saw it, even though there wasn't an image, or the photo was just very blurry. Again, you, know, you try to take a photo and maybe it flies away before you get a good one and you just have a blurry one where you can tell it's an insect, but you can't quite tell what it is. Um, but 82% could be ID'd for order, uh, 65 could be ID'd to family, 58 to genus, and then 43 of them could be ID'd all the way to species. And having a species identification is ideal for 
some of the, the questions, for example, knowing if something's a generalist or a specialist, you kind of have to know what species it is to know what it feeds on. So depending on your question, you kind of need different levels of taxonomic um, certainty. Go on to the next one. So here's overall abundance. Kind of the first thing just to look at is what kind of insects are out there what, that are using flowers. Um, the biggest group of pollinators was, of course, the bees, which is not too surprising, that big orange patch down there. That's the bees, which were 47% 7 of the insects that we found on species, found on flowers, sorry. Uh, second biggest group was the flies. And people often don't think of flies when they're thinking about pollinators, uh, but flies, especially hover flies, flower flies, are actually really important pollinators. They're very, very abundant, uh, tend to be very active, especially in urban areas. Um, so we did have a good proportion of that, about 16%. And then wasps and uh, butterflies were the next two biggest groups. Um, so that was not, nothing in there too surprising. That's what you would typically find for most pollinator um, composition, especially in, in urban areas. There are also a few, few grasshoppers, a few bugs, a few ants, but a few beetles. Next. Okay, next one. Here are um, identified species, and I'm not going to go over all of these, but these are, I think these are all the ones that we had at least more than one identification of. So there's at least two of them out there. Um, I just highlighted a few things of interest. So the top five most common species. Uh, the most common one was the Western honeybee. 18% of all of our um, observations were Western honeybees. Next was the common Eastern bumblebee, which was 8% of all observations. And the next three most common species were the cabbage white butterfly, uh, Eastern carpenter bee, those really big carpenter bees, if you're familiar with those, and then the thick-legged hoverfly, which is one of those um, flower flies in that group. And then just a few other ones that you don't, I'm not gonna go over all those, but if you wanna look at them, look at the list more closely later or on, a, on the recording, you can. And then the next slide just divides those up by native and non-native, since that was one of the things I was interested in. Um, so you can see there is a good number of native species as well as a good number of non-native ones. The Western honeybee, the most common one, is of course an introduced species. Uh, the cabbage white and the thick lake hoverfly, three out of the top five, are also non-native species. But we still have a good deal of native ones like the monarch, American lady butterfly, some things that uh, people are probably familiar with. Okay, go to the next one. Um, and then now I'm just going to talk a little bit about the bees in particular, since they were the biggest group um, and the one that me, for me personally, I have the best knowledge on. This is showing the diversity of uh, different genera of bees that we saw. Um, so it is exciting to see, you know, a pretty good number of bee uh, genera being represented. Um, the biggest one, of course, was the honeybee. Like I said, that was the most common, followed by the bumblebees, most of which were the common eastern bumblebee, though we did have a few other bumblebee species as well. Um, we also had a good number of carpenter bees, uh, sweat bees from two different genera, uh, furrow bees, some cellophane bees, um, a few carter bees, um, and some of these images here uh, from <laughs> sorry, <laughs> some of these images here uh, from one of our citizen scientists, Beth Stewart, took some nice images there, so to show some of that diversity. Um, and then I wanted to, like I said, I was interested in what percentage of these were generalist versus specialist foragers, something I was very interested to see. So that's shown in the next slide. So this next slide shows uh, the foraging strategy of the bees, the specialist versus the generalist. Um, for all the bees that I could ID, and again, only 43% of the species could be ID to species, so this doesn't necessarily represent the fact that we didn't have any specialists, but from the ones that we could identify, uh, all of them were generalists. Um, part of that is because those two most abundant species, the western honeybee um, and the eastern bumblebee, are generalists, so those two made up a big proportion of that. Uh, but everybody else that could be ID'd either to genera or to species was also um, a generalist foraging species. Um, and again, that's not surprising in an urban area. It's harder for specialists to survive in this kind of area where there are a lot of different plants and plants are changing. The composition changes as people plant different things in their garden, as things are cut down and replanted. Um, so it is more common to have generalists in this kind of area. Um, but having at least some specialist species in your population is really a good goal for cities. And again, this is, does not, I put that little quote at the bottom, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It certainly doesn't mean that we don't have any specialists in Somerville. Um, the next slide shows 
uh, if you want to go to the next slide, Claire, that if you dig a little bit deeper in iNaturalist, there have been um, recordings of more specialized bee species in Somerville. Uh, these are some that EWA, that Claire collected, um, some of a, a minor bee, um, a, a leafcutter bee, a uh, few bees that are a little bit more specialized in their foraging habitats. So they are out there. They're just not very common. Um, and I think we could still do a lot more to attract specialists. It's estimated that about 25% of bee species are specialists. So we're certainly not at that point. Um, so there's certainly more the city could do to attract and to maintain more specialist populations to increase our bee diversity. Just that, this one, by the way, it was my driveway. I remember it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> at least there in your driveway. Exactly. <laughs> so you can go to the next slide. I think this is the summary slide here. Oops. I remember right. So takeaways, bees and flies appear to be our most abundant pollinators. Um, at least three of the top five most common pollinators were non-native, but there was a good diversity, at least of native species that we found. And Last one, all the identified bee species in our transects were generalist feeders or unknown feeding. We didn't have any specialist feeders found, at least on our transects, which again, doesn't mean they're not out there, but there's not enough of them out there that they're easy to find. Um, and again, limitations in this data, since it is very preliminary, we only have five transects, only August to October, so that's something I really want to expand this year. Do the full growing season, increase the number of transects, get a better data set, and only 43% could be identified to species. Uh, so adding in uh, more of my own collections, um, especially for more specialist species in order to get those ID'd is also important. And then finally, I really want, like Claire was saying earlier, I need to link these pollinators to the plant availability. So looking at what plants they're using and what plants are out there but that they're not using um, to figure out you know, how we're really supporting them and in what areas we could be supporting them better. And then the one last part of the project, uh, is these pollinator pots that I mentioned earlier. Um, these are pots with native species in them. And I think there's a lot of interesting possibilities for pots like this because in urban areas, it can be hard to establish plants and then have to cut them down. So one thing cities can do is create kind of mobile um, gardens basically that you could move around. So if you had to do construction in an area, you could move the pots to another area, move them back, uh, kind of create these mobile gardens rather than gardens that have to be cut down uh, when uh, construction or things like that change. So we had 12 of these pots in 2019, adding 48 new native plants and 10 species in the Somerville area. Um, so far there's been a high rate of plant survival over winter. That was one of my things, was wondering how well these plants would do in the pots, but so far everyone who's been reporting to me has shown high survival of their plants and that their plants are coming back after the winter, so that's good news. There's some outreach educational component here. The pots all had signs on them kind of explaining the project. And I did get several emails from people who saw the pots and were interested in the project or emailed me photos of insects they saw in the pot. So that also had that, that component to having these pots out there. And this is something I wanna expand on 2020 um, and potentially compare the survival and flowering of the plants in pots versus on the ground. How does living in a pot affect these plants and how might that affect the pollinators? And so I'll go more, in, at, later on we have a slide that talks a little bit more about opportunities in 2020, but that kind of wraps up what I saw in 2019. Uh, so I can hand it, hand it back to Claire for her data. Thanks, uh, Amy. So here, so we're going back to you over there, and so we're going to take a little big picture for a minute. Uh, so you know about co-creative cons uh, conservation and citizen science. So we do, we, we do a lot of projects. So we have actually four locations here, and these are the class of uh, what's called the biodiversity, uh, essential biodiversity classes that we try to monitor. We are very much focused right now on occurrence and abundance as well as distribution. Actually, we do also a lot of phenology. We do migration because we follow birds around uh, a lot. Um, and we're about to start, you know, uh, looking more deeply at the national um, to, to, feed, to feed a national effort to understand, you know, uh, the dynamic of invasive species. We're probably going to start that with the FELS, very cool, um, very cool protocol there, right? So arthropod is one of our um, studies there, right, that we like to link really with everything around, so we're at the very beginning. 
what is important for me, right, or for E1 general, not just me, is really this protocol. So remember that I'm a statistician, so a protocol for statistician, that's gold, right? So something that is repeatable, uh, something that is measurable, that is that something that is comparable over, you know, a, a larger location uh, scale is very important. And on top of that, I belong to a new class of statistician, which are really, we're working with patterns as well over a large scale. So um, I told you that global data is important because uh, people who know me know that I have a little sentence that I often say, which is, you know, a piece of data that is stuck in a drawer or an Excel spreadsheet somewhere on your computer and doesn't go anywhere is dead data. What I think is very important in this day and age is really that we share that data uh, for the science out there, the scientists, not just locally, but also nationally and internationally. That's something that I want to uh, reach out with in Basic Species, and we belong to international network for that as well. Uh, these are the platforms that we use, iNaturalist. We have intersecting uh, iNaturalist project with Amy, right? Uh, our data actually flows, so only in Somerville, flows into um, Amy's um, uh, project as well. Our project usually are more close simply because we train our citizen scientists and we want to control the data quality. Data quality is super important for me, so we really push there um, to try to have a control of the data. We use also caterpillar counts that's going to be important for what we are doing in terms of counting abundance there. So that's a platform. Um, so the sites that we have, as I said, we have currently four sites and actually this one is kind of outdated because we are already expanded on some um, uh, studies in Somerville. Uh, these are partners. So we do, you know, at the Habitat, we work with Masodobam, right? They are a host there. This is a water, uh, the Cambridge Water Department, that's Fresh Farm. Uh, Middlesex Fells so Reservation, very dear uh, for us to my heart. I'm actually also a board member of the Friends of the Fells. Uh, so we're doing very cool things there over all the fells. You'll see the map and Green Open Somerville and uh, Somerville Community Center for abundance of arthropods in the growing center. We are uh, reaching out there or expanding. This is our map. So this is actually an old map, an old count. Uh, this is from my naturalist, right? This is uh, some of our site and here is Somerville. So here is a growing center, but actually there is some data that are not showing that are more there. Yeah. So very cool. If you go on iNaturalist and see our umbrella project, Iwa Biodiversity uh, Project, you're going to see that we have something like uh, 32,000 uh, observation just on occurrence data. All right, oh, but here it is. So actually it's more now. So these are the platform that we use just in a nutshell, iNaturalist. So uh, this uh, Iwa Biodiversity Project is an umbrella project that has several projects underneath. And this is some of the out of the box uh, statistic that you can have. And you can see that, again, we are looking at also other species, right? And here are the insects, they are there. And of course, we are looking at the plants as well. And we are more and more using protocols where we link the two together to make sure that we have an interaction species data uh, being collected as well. So this is iNaturalist and our biodiversity project. These slides were going to be, uh, are going to be available to you. And anywhere you click, you're going to land on these different projects. Um, I'm not going to talk much about that yet, right, or for this talk, but we are partner with the National Phenology Network. Actually, we received an award from them this year. We are their Phenol Champion Award for 2019, right? Uh, and there, what we do is we study the seasonal cycles on fauna and flora. And I want to do, we want to do in the growing center, we want to tie more, you know, between the pollinators and some of the plants so that we really can follow phenology, both of the pollinators, what's happening, activity curve with what's happening with the plants. So I see a lot of collaboration between Amy and I to try to put that, you know, um, uh, up the, the ground and expand it. So here, so um, I'm going to actually go to the full slide. So here it's about occurrence and mapping. So occurrence, you know, what you see, not necessarily what you don't see, it's really about what you see, because you cannot record on a naturalist what you don't see. Uh, but mapping is important because it's about distribution of the different species there. Uh, so here it's different. It's about composition and abundance. Uh, I'm very much into uh, understanding abundance of species uh, because I think that too often we focus on extension of species and we do not really look very closely at what's called or what's named definition, which is, you know, the volume of species going down. I think that is very, a very important type of data. There is not enough yet done there. 
We're using the protocol from the Cataplus Count. Cataplus Count is a project from uh, the University of North Carolina. Uh, they are, um, it's off the project, which is called Phenomic Mismatch, right? And what they are trying to understand, again, is phenology of arthropods with uh, plants and birds and these kind of things. Uh, very cool protocol. So coming with us, you're going to learn about that because you'll learn how to identify and use all this kind of um, uh, data platform, which are, again, open platform, uh, which uh, promotes really accessibility and uh, uh, global data nationally or internationally. I uh, just want to mention one thing. I see people uh, popping on the chat, so we'll look at that a little bit later. Amy might be uh, looking at some of the chat to answer that, but we'll have a little bit of time at the end. I think it's, it's not going to me. It must be going to you. I haven't gotten it. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll look at that a little bit uh, uh, later I'm, because Amy doesn't have access to that. We're trying to figure out how to co-access you know, a slide and it just didn't work. So we'll do that the old style in a sense, but we'll look at that in a minute. Just to look back, you know, why bother? We know about the decline right, of insect. We need to act now. We know that there are big data gaps right, uh, with respect both of occurrence and abundance or species interaction. And what we are interested with you are with Amy's uh, as well is to compare across locations in the region, right? And this data also can serve at the national level, right? Uh, one thing that is important as well, people don't understand that often or don't miss that, is that it's also a mode when you start looking at occurrence abundance data and looking at things like that, it's a surveillance kind of uh, activity as well. So that means that you can detect new things, new threats or things going out of proportion such as invasive. And invasive is not just about you know, a plant, it's also about uh, different species of uh, um, arthropod. Speaking of which, I want to just mention something about our dear Western honeybee. The Western honeybee or the honeybee, you know, there is uh, each time that I see things you know, online, it's about saving the honeybee. In a sense, the honeybee doesn't need to be saved. It's kind of the chicken of uh, the bee world there, right? They are not from here, they're important, the important generalists, but one thing to know, is that when there is food scarcity, then it outcompete native bees. Uh, we have about we have about four thousand um, species of native bees in America, twenty thousand worldwide, right? Of uh, bees in general, four thousand. In the past few decades, seeing our native bees have declined radically, something like fifty percent. I'm not saying that they have declined; that you know they don't exist, but we have a hard time to see them now, right? So it's not necessarily the doing of that, but you know there is many other factors. But you know, looking at other species that might also have a bad interaction with our native bees or native pollinators is very important, and we don't have enough data about that yet. So uh, these are some of the species that we uh, see regularly in the area. Again, this is not, this is, these are, guys are tough, by the way. I, I just realized that last year. I was at a night, you know, uh, we're doing a moth night, and there was one of those guys, so it's a sting bug, sucking up, you know, a, a, a moth of some sort. I'm like, my God, it didn't let go. So it's it, it, superb, but very tough guys, very tough guys. Um, so here, look at this beauty. Look at the eyes. Again, come with us. We'll teach you. We'll show you how. We'll share our tips about how to take this kind of picture because this, this one is mine. This was with my phone. Um, and here, this is actually uh, a squirrel. I think that it was at the growing center. Yeah, it was at the growing center. Here, it's the thing. So little data that we found the first year. Remember, like Amy, same thing. We kind of started late in the process, right? So um, as a statistician, good statistician, I'm going to tell you that anything in the first year, uh, it's only if it's mid-year, serve, serve you know, barely as baseline data. It's more anecdotal data, but it's important. You have to start somewhere. So these were collected, these kind of uh, uh, graphs were done actually using caterpillar counts data, right? And the caterpillar counts data is focused on abundance. How much of things do you see? And you usually uh, identify at the order level, right? Which is kind of an easy way in, uh, in my opinion, to enter in the identification, the world of identification of uh, insects. Um, you could see, that it's interesting, that uh, you see a lot of flies there. Um, and and anecdotally, people or scientists have a tendency to think that at the very big beginning, young citizen scientists have a tendency to catch a lot of flies more than any other uh, uh, type of uh, insect. In our case, might have been, but we're going to show you other graphs that kind of disprove that, as well as result, results for the year. So this one, we're really looking at some very specific mock trees, and we were counting, counting order of insects. Uh, 
very important data because you can see composition per species as well. So it can also teach us uh, in terms of um, uh, native versus you know, non-native plants and the relationship with uh, these uh, orders of insect. Uh, this is about phenology or activity curve, you know, in terms of uh, presence of um, uh, arthropods or insects in general. So just the beginning. And this graph, I want to mention it because it's interesting, because this one is not about abundance, it's about occurrence, more general composition, using our result for iNaturalist, where we did also a visual survey of the surrounding. So it's not about the tree anymore, it's also a long transect in the growing center there. And actually, interestingly, of course, the picture is radically different. And that brings me to tell you something, the importance of using different protocol or looking at different angle when you look at you know, this kind of um, uh, species or uh, questions in general. So very first preliminary data, we started very late as well, right? Uh, but it's pretty cool. Now, you know that we have four sites and last year we got a mention by the Caterpillar Scouts guys saying, oh, we, so there were 55 sites that were recorded by Caterpillar Scout and the University of North Carolina. We came first at the fells at Habitat. It's not that we are necessarily better or nothing like that. We are very diligent, right? So we really teach very well, train very well our citizen scientists to really find those arthropods and identify them. We bring also visual data just to make sure that they can cross validate what we are finding. The thing as well shows that they were there, as simple as that, right? It's not about being good. It's also because those caterpillars here were there, so we found them, right? Uh, and one of our goal, right, is really to see the growing center, Somerville, to come and to become part of the deal here, right, as well as Fresh Farm, right? I'm going to show you some data. Uh, so at the fells, beautiful little, um, so few species that we found. This one was really cool. That was during the BioBlitz for E.O. Wilson. Uh, I think that Amy, I've seen you having one of those, right, on one of your records, am I right? Right, so, okay. Uh, I love this little Micracena, that's a, a spider there, right? And we have a deer population in the fells as well. All right, the fells, completely different kind of story here. Look at that. Of course, we have our caterpillars, right? There was something uh, that was very interesting about those caterpillars. It looks like that's two of the species that we picked somehow had an invasion of some of these caterpillars, right? So uh, somehow we also got kind of lucky in a sense, right? So, and we want to understand more. Is it a kind of an anecdotal type of event or is it going to happen again this year? We're about to set up our sites in order to uh, follow this exact same species. But the witch hazel and sassafras and these two were close to one another. So what does it mean? So when you look at the data, you have to dig into the data to understand a little bit what is the story behind. Same thing, first year here, right? Um, it's much harder to survey in a forest, by the way. We don't necessarily have those meadow in the vicinity, but uh, very interesting, that's a visual survey. Uh, we did a lot in other areas of the fells where there are meadows and we have fantastic citizen scientists who really have an eye to detect you know, grasshoppers and all these kind of things. Activity curves, we started earlier. First year, it's baseline, just pure baseline, right? But you see the difference here between what we saw here and what we saw here, right? Flies, no caterpillars, a lot of caterpillars, flies a little bit, but we saw a lot of beetles as well. Cool beetles in the fells, right? we were happy to see them. Um, we did that at the habitat, this is a cool, I remember seeing it actually. I took this one as well. Uh, I was looking at, um, I forgot what it was, almost something like that. And this little guy was there and look at the little feet of this guy. Beautiful, beautiful flies. Who said that flies are not beautiful? I think they are beautiful. And that was uh, here um, during a night, a moth night. And look at this beauty, which are not from here, right? The name says it, right? Uh, this is the data that we found, first year of data as well. We see that like the fells, by the way, the peak was around July. So we want to see if it repeats there. Uh, this is about the composition. Same thing, caterpillars are there, right? A lot of beetles, as, uh, not, uh, not sorry, uh, the fly are there. I'm looking a little bit. Leaf hopper are interesting as well. Actually, the last one is going to be very interesting. Right? So preliminary data, different species that we are looking at. You know, the species that are in the fells, uh, in the fells at the habitat as well. And here at Fresh Pond was very interesting. It actually was, in my opinion, something that uh, in terms of pictures between the abundance and the visual survey that we are doing was radically different. So again, it 
brings the importance of doing different kind of protocol to cover different angle. So at Fresh Palm, we barely found caterpillars, barely on our trees, right? However, so we found tons of leaf hoppers. They were there, they were all over the place. I'm super happy that we did this visual survey of the middle in the center. So somehow, if you look at our map, right, you would see that our trees, our marked trees for computing abundance are around the middle, right? And then you have a large meadow that we visited a couple of times. So each time we do our visual, we do transect, by the way. And the story was radically different there. So to a point where citizen science in action, right, from our citizen scientists, we started to think that it would be nice to have a protocol rather than reinventing the wheel to ask those guys at Caterpillar Scout to see if they could extend their protocol somehow to also accommodate for a different kind of habitat, not just trees, you know, a specific branch on the trees, et cetera, but also maybe with meadow plots. So we are talking about that with them. So preliminary data, and here somehow we didn't, no caterpillar, we couldn't really detect, right, uh, uh, true good pics about caterpillars there, just here. Why bother? You know that. I showed you that, you know, filling data gaps, etc. For us, the story, again, is about comparing the different sites. Anecdotal data, it's the first year, but look at that. It's interesting just at the possible question and maybe confirming some findings already. You look at the fells, you look at the habitat. So the fells is forest, it's an urban forest. You look at the habitat, it's a sanctuary, right? Actually a lot of invasive there, but it's a little bit remote. It's not like Fresh Pond. Fresh Pond Reservoir is in the middle of Cambridge or in our most you know, populated cities. I mean, I think that Somerville is one of the densest, you know, uh, fastest growing city in United States, one of the top 10, where we have a hard time to find any green space. And look at that here, just in terms of the trends there. So by having this kind, establishing this kind of comparison, not just with the fells, the habitat or fresh pond, but maybe other neighboring, you know, cities, you know, doing this kind of things together, we could bring, you know, more of this story there to go and reach our cities, right? So that's one of my agenda there. Okay, so uh, we'll answer your question uh, a little bit later. So we're coming to what do we want to do, you know, this year? Amy, you want to start? Sure. So for my project, I uh, basically want to expand what we've already been doing. Um, uh, so pollinator pots, and um, I have this idea of adding this year pollinator patches. Um, my goal is to add 20 more pots um, and 20 more patches, depending if I can get enough people interested in. And the idea would be to plant the same plants in the pots and the patches, same four plants, uh, different species, but same number of each plant and then monitor over the next couple of years the growth of the plants, the flowering time and their survival. Do the plants in pots, for example, flower earlier because they're warmer? Do they flower later because they need more time to grow um, during the spring? So that kind of thing just to see how living in a pot affects these native plants. Are they growing that don't grow as much, produce less flowers, that kind of thing to see you know, if, if plants are really, in pots are a, a genuine substitute for plants in the ground in, a, in an urban area. Um, another one is just expanding on the pollinator surveys. Um, like I said, I want to do more transects and I want to cover the whole growing season this time. So I'm hoping to get started next month and to find more citizen scientists who are interested in doing this. And this will involve walking 250 meter transects you know, within walking distance of where you live, ideally. Um, something that can be done in a socially distant, responsible manner, wearing the mask, avoiding getting six feet with other people. So this is stuff that can, that can still be done um, even under uh, the current way that we're living. Um, and my hope there is to look at not only the pollinators, but also the plants that are present, that they're using, and the plants that are present that they're not using to get an idea of what um, plants within the city they're actually, that are actually supporting pollinators the best way and to do the same photographic survey and also to have me go in and do traditional surveys to kind of fill in some of the gaps in some of those groups that we're having a hard time identifying from flowering from the, from the photos, uh, but not having to collect the groups that are easy to identify from photos to therefore reduce uh, total impact. Um, so um, we are gonna send out, I believe, a, a survey to everyone who participates in this webinar. So that if you're interested in this, you'll have a chance to answer. Let us know if you're interested. Um, for my project, I'm mostly in or nearby Somerville because I wanna be able to get to the transect so that I can do sampling. Uh, but if you live in the area, definitely something you can get involved in. And if you don't live in the area, but you wanna try to replicate this in some way um, where you live, you could also let me know. 
so I, I'm going to gain a pot. Pot. I didn't get my pot last year, <laughs> so I'm begging you know Amy about having my pot. I want my pot as well. My data is filling into uh, you know our data and my data is definitely uh, filling uh, Amy's uh, projects. I'm super happy about that. All right. So about Iwa. So and by the way, uh, what Amy says it's for 2020, but we want to do that. You know, things do not happen in a year in our world, right? It's only in a natural world. So when we say 2020, it's 2020 plus, right? We're just starting. We're inviting people to join now and for the years to come. Or even if it's just for a year, it's going to help. But you know, it's it's a long term project. So uh, let's. Um, so for Iwa, what do we want to do is want to continue what we started, the different studies, including the arthropods. We want to enroll and train new citizen scientists. Uh, you know about our way. We are, we are a very inclusive group, so, and we do continuous training. That's something, and certainly when you go in the forest, that's something that becomes more important, right? Because it's uh, very hard to necessarily find your way. Actually, COVID-19 pushed us to start to do a dynamic maps so that people can find their way through the forest, through the species, through the sites, and do that on their own. So uh, we have fantastic fantastic solo monitoring right now. Uh, we've helped them with these dynamic maps, right? Um, so we train our people. With doing that, what happens is we're also creating a community. So more and more people are coming in a group. They come regularly because we do that certainly monthly. Uh, besides our weekly uh, uh, surveys where the scientists, uh, citizen scientists join us. But monthly, people like to come because it becomes a group, right? It becomes a, a community of uh, like-minded people, right? We like to learn a lot together as well. So for us, it's about cross-cities insect occurrence survey using our iNaturalist project. So, and when we say that, you know, there is a protocol, it's through Transect as well. Uh, and actually, uh, Amy helped us with setting up the original protocol, right? Uh, it's also about abundance survey. So what we do with caterpillar uh, counts at all sites, right? Um, same thing, we train people, it's slightly different. We, in, we uh, identify at order and help people understand how to fill this kind of uh, um, uh, information through uh, the app. So there is a lot of app learning with us. And what we want to do, by the way, is also certainly coming with uh, uh, when it relates to Somerville and to expand that, we want really to more directly link plant to pollinator phenology, right? Uh, we're going to use for that because we are a national phenology network and we do already uh, phenology, so uh, study of seasonal cycle on fauna and flora and so in the flora. So we want to extend that to also do the same kind of recording, but also for pollinators with the plant that they are interacting with in a specific uh, location there. So, um, Come and study with us, monitor with us. Um, everything is going to be really out there in terms of uh, the recording and uh, this uh, presentation. So you'll be able to click and find information that way as well. Plus what Amy mentioned, which is to send a survey if you want to um, uh, be with us or join us or extend this type of um, uh, surveys. So again, right, call to action. Is it hard? Are we going to learn? Is it useful? Is it fun? We invite you really to join us and do that all together. Right, Amy? Yeah. Ah, you're muted. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going, oh, I don't want to forget that. Most important. <laughs> we have really, so in the first year, I think that Amy can say the same thing. We had uh, uh, interest from people and no, they started and they really hooked with us. They, they really uh, uh, stayed with us. And I'm, I'm super grateful about you know, these people being with us right now, helping and gathering this data, pushing, you know, quest questioning, challenging the protocols, refining those protocols. They are just wonderful people. So I want to thank them uh, personally. Amy? Yes, I listed the citizen scientists um, and students who helped as well with my project and also those who are Hosting pollinator pots currently taking care of those. So this being said, I'm going to run that. No, I don't know. I forgot where it is because I want to also, so we have, we just want to show you the perks, but I want to open and to look at the chat to see what's happening here. This is some of the beauty that we saw. Oh, here is, okay, just three. Some of the beauty that uh, we found. This, these are flies, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. A little bit of time, so we can go through that. This is one of his uh, hoppers, tussock moss. All of that, it's going a little bit fast. 
I didn't succeed in slowing it down, it looks like. I was trying to slow it down to five seconds between each picture, and look at that, it's just going too fast. Uh, this is, look at this beautiful, talk about interaction of species there, right, and what's happening. I love this picture. I love this photograph there. Um, a lot of things between the halfhead and uh, the cat did here and on this plant, right? So, which we record, we record all the things together. A few more bees, brown belted bumblebee. A beauty that is not from here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. They are beautiful then. We were naughty, paparazzi, you know, borderline us, unethical, <laughs> meeting dragonflies. Hoppers, this is in Somerville. When you start to see them, they are very small. You see them everywhere. Beautiful hoppers. Look at this cute, cute little jumping spiders. Bush cricket in a fresh pond. People now know me for looking in the heart of flowers to see what gets there and bushing some potential things. So, found something. Let me pause a little bit and to see what people are asking. No, I want to see the chat. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to, I'm looking at the question there, just to make sure we address all the questions before the end of the talk. Uh, what is the source of those maps? I assume the person is talking about the iNaturalist maps, right? Which would be, let me go back there, there. Um, I'm going to go back to some slides such as, I assume you're talking about this kind of maps, right? Uh, these are iNaturalist maps, the distribution map, right? If, you, if it is something other, uh, please tell me and I will. Yes, and I will uh, share that. Um, so all those maps are off you know, uh, the box, out of the box you know, type of uh, distribution map from iNaturalist. So I, we don't even have to create really something very specific about these maps. Right. Uh, we can be more details, you know, about order, etc., and, and act upon the data itself because all the data is public. But this one that I have here is really an out-of-the-box map, so very easy to find that. And they have nice little legends, so it's uh, very well done. Um, okay, and then did you say that you could take, yes, yes, definitely. I have little tricks, little tips, right? One of my most, uh, was on, one of my favorite um, uh, tips is this one, right? So this is my phone here, right? I have an Android phone. It's actually an old one, a Pixel 2. And I never leave, even inside my house, by the way, because <laughs> you never know what you can find on your walls or you know, between cracks or the, I found little spiders. I'm a lover of spiders. And this is one of this magnifying glass. It comes with practice, of course, not just because you have that, that everything suddenly is going to be beautiful. Uh, but this is definitely something that helps. This one, for example, was likely to be one that I've taken, you know, with a magnifier like that, right? So, and we'll teach, you know, some uh, lessons about how to take the picture, how to stabilize. We have plenty of different uh, tips to really stabilizing the picture because this can be hard, right? So you are relatively close to that uh, little critter there. Uh, on my phone, what kind of zoom do I have on my phone? Um, I don't know, I have to check that. Uh, but no, it's a standard. It's, as I said, it's a few years old uh, zoom on Android. I don't know, I'll double check, I'll uh, give the answer through um, uh, an email response, right? And that is in terms of the zoom of the magnifying, this is a 20 times. If you go, um, oh, the magnifier, okay. So uh, the magnifier is a 20. If you go above that, right, uh, it's becoming difficult um, it, because you have an edge effect around, uh, you know, at the border there. It also have a large opening, by the way. Sorry, I'm looking at my screen, that's here. It has a large opening. Let me show you what is this large opening about here. And that large opening is important because you spend, I'm quick, you know, I move that thing very quickly to have a habitat picture without the magnifier or with a magnifier, I'm going to go and try to zoom on whatever I'm taking the picture of. So I can move it very quickly without having to struggle to adjust it. So this kind of magnifier is good because it has a large opening. Um, I forgot the brand, uh, but same thing. I can, con if you contact me, I'll, uh, I'll find the brand and I'll share that. Let me continue a little bit on some of this uh, picture here while we are there, right? One of these bees there. Are there other questions? We've seen this one. 
This was in the growing center, for sure, American lady, fairly common, yeah. Uh, this was in uh, Martha's Vineyard. Look at, look at the beauty of the eyes there. Look at that. Right. It's very small, it's a very small, very small bee. Right. I forgot what it was. It's recorded uh, on what it was. Maybe a thistle or something? <laughs> Not sure. Look at this orchard orb weaver, right? A little bit blurry when you zoom in like that, but still not bad, right? Plant hopper, there, look at that. <laughs> this was in Somerville, I remember that. Eastern Calpertal Bee, look at that, how shiny and fuzzy it is. You can almost feel it. Um, and that's it, that's how I made So that's, all that we have for you, uh, let me uh, unshare so that I see a little bit who is still there. Uh, and maybe uh, if someone wants to uh, ask another question, do not hesitate. Do effort to help honeybees also benefit native insects or should something else happen? Amy, do you want to take on that one? Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of overlap, uh, basically helping both honeybees and native insects involves planting a lot of native plants. Um, planting non-native plants tends to help honeybees and also generalist natives, uh, but planting more native plants will get at more of the, the specialists, uh, the native specialists who might be not as interested in generalist plants. Um, I think specialists, uh, overwintering sites is also really important for protecting native insects. That's something people don't think about as much, not only providing food during the summer, but, but providing safe places for them to overwinter. A lot of native insects will overwinter either as pupa underground or in leaf litter under rocks, um, inside the stems of uh, dried up plants, things that you might otherwise cut down or you might weed out of your garden or you know brushing up your leaves, like leaving all that stuff, leaving leaves on the ground, letting plants sit over winter and not doing cleanup until warm, until the warm weather. Um, that really helps uh, native insects as well. Not only the bee, not only the pollinators, but things like fireflies and all sorts of native insects that really need that kind of mulch uh, to overwinter. And they need leaves, they need sticks, they need uh, kind of dried up plant material um, to, to overwinter in. Um, yeah, those are the two. And, and mowing less, not mowing lawns, letting things grow. Uh, those are the main things that I can think of, which do support the honeybees as well. Uh, but Focusing on native plants, I think, in particular, is important for getting at the native species and not just the honeybees. And, and like, like Claire said, if there's an abundance of resources, then honeybees aren't really a problem for native bees. But when the resources get small, then there can be that competition between honeybees and native bees uh, that can, can cause declines in the native bees. But if the resources are plentiful, so if you're putting out lots of plants and flowers, um, then the, that competition isn't going to exist. So if you want to raise honeybees, that's great. And adding as many plant, plants and flowers as you can in that area just to make sure they're not out-competing native bees is probably the best thing you can do. There is a, a also having a variety of native plants is very important. People do not realize that bees have different morphology and for example, their tongue, right? So, so uh, you have short, medium and long tongue. So, you know, everything is going to depend on the flower itself, right? Uh, for example, in the fells, uh, the way for us to uh, distinguish a little bit uh, some of the low bush versus medium or high bush blueberries is sometimes looking at the flower itself. Right. And when the flower has a little slit on the side, right, it might have been somehow poked or pierced by a specific type of bee, right, which didn't have enough of a long tongue. So it went on the side in order to get inside. Right. So it helps uh, to identify actually the plants in this case. So the point being here that different flowers have different morphology. Right. So some are kind of deep in, some are more flat, some have a ray, you know, of uh, pistil, etc. And all these different, you know, native plants are going to satisfy a different kind of native bees or native pollinators or insects in general. So diversity is important. Uh, I think it talks to the fact that, you know, having a larger biodiversity, you know, increase somehow or replenish, help replenish, you know, our, our insect um, composition or different insect species. Would, would it be right, uh, Amy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. So, all right. Yeah, I, I also, uh, one more thing to add, just plants that bloom over the growing season is also a really important thing too, having early spring bloomers, you know, later spring, summer, fall, that also really helps support the bees during their whole 
uh, life cycle. So they're not just getting lots of food in the summer and then nothing to eat at the beginning and end of the year. So that's another thing to look for when you're planting diversity, a diversity of plants that bloom at different times is good too. A good book, by the way, there are several fantastic books, but I discovered this book fairly recently. I was at a, a, a conference somewhere, a local conference, and this one is great because it also, you know, describe, you know, the, the, the first, the habitat, the kind of habitat, right? Woodland versus uh, prairie versus uh, others, you know, garden, urban, etc., wetland edge. And it sh somehow, it's all about native. So it also talk of the relationship with some of the native insects, right? Or insects in general. But it also show you uh, um, the flowering period. So like that, it can help you plan and design your garden so that somehow you cover the entire season. There is no kind of uh, low time for the visitors of your garden. So I recommend this one. Uh, try to remember to put that in our email when we send that to you. Very good book. Right. Pollinators of Native Plant by Ether Ohm. <laughs> All right. Okay. So that's, um, I saw someone, oh yeah, some, someone said that, yeah. No, that's fine, Sarah. Um, we'll be happy to have you, you know, on, through email, etc. So is there something else that we want to discuss about? I don't think so. I think we cover it all. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our collaborative talk. I'm very excited to do that. Uh, this is something that I was used to do in some of my previous work. So I'm happy to bring it actually um, in, in this kind of format. So I want to do more with Amy like that, so, and more with our communities. So join us and you'll hear from us only through the survey and through the email. Uh, that will be the email, the follow-up email to this uh, talk. All right. Yeah, thank you all for coming. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> yeah, we send out, we'll definitely send out the survey and you can feel free to, to distribute that if you know, you know other people who might be interested. Um, that would be great too, or groups you could post it in, that would be super helpful. Yeah, yes, definitely. Good point, Amy. Yes, we need people. We need to have you uh, and spreading the words. So it's uh, many people. So um, thank you so much.